Hi, I am Frederica from the Joy of Syntax and English in Color. And it is my great honor and privilege to talk today to Nadia Colburn. Nadia Colburn um, is a writer and a poet and a yogi, and she teaches all three. And I would actually like her to introduce herself because she knows so much better what she's on about. Hello, Nadia. Thank you for talking to me. Hi, Fried. I'm so happy to be talking to you. And um, thank you for inviting me to have this conversation. So um, I, as you said, I'm a writer. I write poetry and um, creative nonfiction, so essays and memoir. And I am also a writing teacher and coach. Um, and I help people really come into their authentic voice and write the work that they want to write. And whatever issues are around that, both what's on the page with issues of craft and style and the issues of what's happening beneath the page. What brings us to write? How is it connected to the stories that we hold in our body? How is it connected to larger social stories, the stories that we're allowed to tell and the stories that we're told we're not allowed to tell? Mm -hmm. What happens when we break those taboos and start telling stories that are a little bit less convenient to tell as we're seeing with the Me Too moment? movement, for example, you know, how do we start to tell different stories and what are the effects of telling different stories? These are questions that have always answered me, uh, always um, interested me, you know, and I'm always looking for the answers to these, to these questions in my own writing and then also in my work with clients and as a teacher in of my classes. Yes, and I think you're a wonderful teacher. I benefited from you several times and I still do because you helped me write the introduction to my book and you invited me to your wonderful class and I'm looking forward to more time together. I would like you, if that's fine with you, to share with us how did you come to writing? I think that's not, not everybody does and so how did it happen for you? Um, I came to writing as I think many people do through reading um, and I grew up in a house with a lot of books mm -hmm. But my sister, on the other hand, you know, she wasn't drawn to be a writer. But from a very early age, I loved to read. And mm -hmm. I felt like there was a truth and paradoxically an immediacy sometimes in books that I didn't find in normal day-to-day -day life, right? There's kind of intensity and honesty. Mm -hmm. um, and so I read a lot and at a certain point, you know, when you're so involved in any medium, then you want to kind of participate in it mm -hmm. and give back also. So, um, but the, the time that I decided I really wanted to be a writer was when I was, became pregnant with my first child. So I had always been a reader mm -hmm. and I, I wrote a little bit in college, a little bit after college, but I decided to get a PhD in English instead of an MFA. I really wanted to study other people's writing and contribute by keeping the literature that I loved alive and mm -hmm. being a teacher of literature. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until I became pregnant, I wanted to be pregnant and I said, this is so great, I'm gonna be having a baby and all of a sudden I thought, you know, I also want to tell my story. I want my voice to be there. I don't want to just study other people's voices. I want to participate in this endeavor of creativity, mm -hmm. um, not only by being a mother, but also by being a writer. And so I think I really decided I'm going to be a writer too at the time that I became a mother. That's really beautiful that, mm -hmm. that writing came out of you while the baby <laughs> was being... Yeah was growing inside of you. May I ask how old you were? I was 27. Well, I was 26 when I got pregnant and then 27 when Gabriel was born. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it was a real conscious decision to be a writer then after your studies. So it just, it just, I was, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, I was in, I was in a PhD program mm -hmm. um, at Columbia university and I the year that I was pregnant there, I said, you know, I really want to take some creative writing classes too. I don't want to just take academic criticism classes. Mm -hmm. So the way Columbia University is set up, 
Over on one side of the campus is the English building. And right across about a five minute walk away, or even less than a five minute walk, is a building with the MFA. So for people who want to get a master's of fine arts and mm -hmm. be writers. So I thought, well, I'll just take some classes there too. Mm -hmm. And they told me, well, you're not allowed to. Ah. Because the program here is only for people who are enrolled in the MFA program and you're enrolled in the PhD program. Mm -hmm. And so you can't take these classes. Mm -hmm. Really? I can take classes in any other department, but I wasn't allowed to take those classes. How weird. It turned out that one of the teachers there, Lucy Brock Broido, also taught a poetry workshop from her home. So I took that class, and that was a great class, and it had lots of students who had graduated from the MFA program, who had mm -hmm. published books, who were now studying with her in her private workshop. So mm -hmm. I took that class with her and mm -hmm. started and then I also, that, that was the year that I um, had a friend who was working and taking classes with Dory Graham, who's a poet, whose work I really um, admired and learned a lot from. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, well, you know, she had just moved to Harvard from Iowa where she had been teaching. And he said, well, you know, she's really interested in having slightly older, not just undergraduate students in her classes. You should write her and see if she would let you come study with her. So... Mm -hmm. I wrote her that year that Gabriel was just born mm -hmm. and she called me up and she said, yeah, come study with me. So we packed up that following year mm -hmm. and I was an exchange scholar at Harvard for the year mm -hmm. so that I could work with her. Mm -hmm. um, so it really was that first year of Gabriel's life that I decided very consciously I'm going to take other kinds of classes. I hadn't finished my PhD, mm -hmm. but, um, I finished it. Then I we moved up to Cambridge for one year, and then we stayed. And I'm still here. Um, <laughs> I my PhD from here. Wow, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, and how did you did, did you get the idea to incorporate meditation and yoga into the creative writing process? So that um, that took longer. <laughs> um, so. As you can tell from the story that I've just told you, mm -hmm. my physical experiences, you know, of being pregnant and becoming a mother, that really definitely instigated my deciding to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, as I was writing, and I was writing in part about motherhood and um, literature and, you know, all different things, um, but writing in some ways, as motherhood did, asked me to look at myself in a different way. Mm -hmm. Really, who am I? Mm -hmm. Where do I come from? And mm -hmm. where do I want to be going? Like, what, what do I want to become? And who do I want to be? Insofar as I have some choice and some agency. Mm -hmm. And um, as I started to look at myself more, I realized I had parts of myself that really weren't clear, that were really blocked up and mm -hmm. um, needed some serious healing. Mm -hmm. And some serious, like, energy flow. Yes. <laughs> so as I did that, um, you know, partly through therapy, but it really led me on this process of self-exploration and self-personal growth. Mm -hmm. And I started to meditate a lot and practice yoga a lot and eventually trained to be a yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a while I had my meditation practice, my yoga practice, my writing practice, my uh -huh. mother they're all kind of different. And at a certain point I said, well, they're all really, really important parts of my life. They've mm -hmm. all helped me and they're all really connected, even though I have to go to different buildings. <laughs> often. To do yes. I think it makes sense for myself to bring these together mm -hmm. and to help other people bring these modalities together. Mm -hmm. and, and I found in my own life, when I can bring together the mind and the body, mm -hmm. I have so much more freedom. I have so much more sense of peace and of power mm -hmm. and of agency and of creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to help other people do that. And, and I bring the mind and the body together, partly by these practices, right? Like the mind and the creativity of the writing, mm -hmm. but the deep listening to the body, to those physical embodied experiences with the yoga, and then also sometimes quieting the mind with the meditation so mm -hmm. that we are not in the just everyday static, but can get to deeper places. Mm. And when we can bring those together, I find it's like 
a chemical reaction. Like you bring the mind and the body together and like spirit is just there. Wow. Only connect. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It's one of my favorite mottos. Yes. And I, you know, I actually think that somehow motherhood, uh, being, not being a woman, but motherhood, and when we have studied, you know, somehow we were, as students, we were totally in the intellectual Western world and totally in our heads. And then as mo mothers, we were connected with the earth again. And I actually think that we have a certain task almost to, to help other people connect that. And, um, and it, it, somehow I just thought about it today while I was teaching that through, through having these two different roles that are usually separated, you know, it helped me to connect something for my students that had been disconnected, but it never occurred to me. Well, I'm still new to the yoga and meditation and I have been resisting it, even though I know it's good for me. <laughs> but that's a different story. Yeah, I mean, I think I see them also not as like they're good for me, but they're part of this larger endeavor mm -hmm. that I'm engaged in. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not like I'm taking this vitamin pill because I know it's good for me, <laughs> yeah. but it's part of my connection, that mm -hmm. interbeing, um, yeah. that, that I'm in touch with myself and I'm in touch with others and I'm, I'm aware of how we're all um, affecting and co connected to one another. Mm. And so even if I'm not, you know, doing the yoga asanas, that's not really the point of the practice on the mat, whether it's silent meditation or chanting or yoga asanas, whatever it is, it's so that we can come into union mm -hmm. and we bring that with us, whatever we do. So you know, one of the things that's so beautiful about breathing meditation and mindfulness meditation is reminds us, well, every breath is itself an opportunity to be awake, to be present, to be in meditation. So we take that with us, whatever we're doing. Mm. You know, so you're already doing yoga and meditation. <laughs> you know, if you could reframe it, that story. Like, I'm doing this already. Mm -hmm. Right when I'm teaching, when I'm connecting, when I'm speaking, when I'm sitting and listening, and I'm in my body and I take a breath, mm -hmm. I'm doing yoga, I'm doing meditation, That's and then true. I enjoy it. So I want to do it a little bit more because I see it's connected to everything else that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's really cool. <laughs> and actually, you know, I I do feel that when I teach. I am very present with what's happening and I forget everything around me. And I guess that is meditation, isn't it? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And you're listening and you're connected and that's really mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. we don't meditate so that we can sit on our mat. Mm -hmm. We meditate so that we can take that awareness and awakeness and attentiveness mm -hmm. with us to the people we're interacting with. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yes, cool. Mm -hmm. And when did you then have the idea to, to, well, to connect business actually with this and become your own boss and to develop this class? Yeah, uh, I think it was about two years ago that I developed my class Align Your Story. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really this feeling of, I don't need to ask for permission. I can do what I want to do and mm -hmm. be of service and create this um, course that brings together these modalities that are often different mm -hmm. and just share it with people. Mm -hmm. So I created it and um, it's been really wonderful to see the community that comes around it because when, you know, when you create something like this and the people who are interested in it, I think they're a very special kind of people like you. And so we have this beautiful community of people around the world in Germany and South Korea and Australia and England and many, many, many of the different States in the U S mm -hmm. coming together in this course with this um, online community and then all the material that's housed online. So you can tap into it as you know, mm -hmm. when you want it and you can take, you don't need to, eat everything at once. <laughs> you can pace yourself and go back to it um, when the time is right for you. 
Yes, I think this is a wonderful opportunity that technology is giving to us, you know, connecting globally with, um, with a common vision. Yeah, I mean, I think that what's happening with technology these days, there's definitely something, there's a real deep shadow side. Yes. Um, and at the same time, then, if we can take the technology and do something positive with it and connect in these positive ways, um, it's here. So to be able to show that we can have connection mm -hmm. with the internet um, and it, you know, being able to do something like this, to take Eastern philosophy and yoga that comes from India, because my, the, the philosopher and teacher that I have studied from the most in the Buddhist tradition is Thich Nhat Hanh. So he's from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And Yogi Bhajan, who teaches Kundalini Yoga from India, and mm -hmm. then American technology and students from around the world. It's like this amazing time that we live in where we get to have the fruits of thousands of years of wisdom and information. And it's like we just have to be careful in selecting where we place our attention. Mm -hmm. And so to some extent, I think of the course as curating, like there's all this great literature out there. Let me curate it for you mm -hmm. and put it together mm -hmm. so that we can, um, you know, create something new from bringing together these different wisdoms from different traditions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Everything has a shadow side and a light side. Right. And, uh, and you know, in, um, I think that in Germany, people are still behind in seeing how much you can benefit from the online world with regard to education and personal development. You know, people, I know so many people who are so hostile to having a conversation like we're having. Mm. But I feel whenever we talk, we really connect. I, you know, I can't hug you and I hope that one day I will be able to. But it, it is coming, you know, it's, it's too two minds and souls meeting. I think it's, it is enabled and um, it's, it's lovely. And it's, it's interesting also because, um, you know, we started uh, talking about books. Like, mm -hmm. How did I become a writer from reading books? Mm -hmm. And I read these books written by people I had never met who were mm -hmm. long dead. I know. <laughs> yes. Open up just this two dimensional, right? Like, flimsy piece of paper and in the beginning just take your head out of the book and there's some there's still <laughs> some wisdom to that right like go live don't read all the time but but really what we're doing having this conversation is certainly more interactive and than reading a book so i think there's often a fear of a new technology that you don't realize that will have the same fear existed with the printing press oh yes i know people <laughs> thought it was the end of the world <laughs> yeah. And with the printing press, right, um, yes. Martin Luther was a direct, you know, positive and negative, but uh, you know, someone said, listen, I'm going to question the authority of the church, which mm -hmm. is going to control how the Bible is read. Mm -hmm. Because there is this new technology of the printing press, mm -hmm. we got to have a different relationship to authority mm -hmm. and to the sacred. Yes. And I think something similar is happening. You know, there's a lot of difficult information we need to wade through. Yes. But really what we're saying is, okay, the information's out there, but we need to choose what do we pay attention to. It's a new kind of opportunity to say, what's my authority? What's my relationship to knowledge and to information, which is out there, to choose? I'm going to use it in this way for these positive benefits mm -hmm. to have this kind of sacred encounter yes and and also i mean this this brings up the issue of what is knowledge and also when you open up a book you know what you know i feel that you open up a book and sometimes there's this good energy that is in there and i know i bring some of it i know i mean i'm i'm co-creating this but there is the opportunity to somehow feel the energy of the person that is dead and i can have a conversation with him or her that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. And it's not simply in my head. There's something mysterious about that. And 
And so, yeah, I, I think, and, and it's, and books can have da dangerous ideas and, and they can shut us off from our, they can disconnect us from ourselves and they can help connect us just like the internet. I mean, it is, it is the same thing in some ways. Yeah. And, and so all the more importantly that we really use it mm -hmm. and create things that are positive in this new form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was so important that you said you read so much and you grew up with all these books and then and then somehow you grew into being a writer, but you also made the decision to be one. And I think it's interesting to, yeah, and it's important to note that you read so much, but then you also made that decision. And I, I see, you know, what is writing? You know, there's so, so many different attitudes and opinions about that. And in Germany, you know, I'm a teacher uh, and... I see that writing is somehow, I don't know, somehow devalued somehow. It's like a, it's not a, not even seen as a craft. It's just like a, to, a tool. And yes, writing can be a tool, but it's just like something, like a container that you just go and pick up and then you throw it away again. It's just, um, you know what I'm getting at? It's just like, yeah. something, oh, you're supposed to be able to do it. Like, you know, just buy this car and drive. It's not... It's not something that needs to be cultivated and where you really see, you know, you need to cultivate a relationship with the language and then with yourself and then with the writing. And then people just think it's just like some saran wrap and you wrap some truth into it. That's really interesting. And it's interesting for me. I don't speak German. Mm -hmm. um, I wish, you know, some of my favorite poetry is written in German, mm -hmm. um, especially Wilke. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems like a language and a tradition that has so valued um, beautiful writing. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to hear that that tradition is no longer maybe valued in the same way. I think in, I feel that in the schools it isn't. People are just expected to be able to write as if it was just a matter of going to the store and buying a pen. Hmm. And, and so they, they, they don't know it's, there's, there's no input and no absorption of, of all, all that has come before. And it's just, you know, just like we know our mother tongue because we absorbed it with our whole bodies while we were in our mom's valleys. I mean, it was the energy, you know, just putting us into vibration with it. Yeah. And, and then somehow you know, we grew into it. And then writing is another step, but it also needs to be cultivated. And there is a craft side and an art side to it. And, and it, it doesn't just happen by you picking up a pen. <laughs> and, right. uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I find it interesting to talk to writing teachers and to, to just listen to how they developed a relationship with writing and then also how they pass that on. Yeah. Well, I always say it's really important for writers to read mm -hmm. and we need to get the language into our ears, into our bodies, like yes. into the vibration, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say when my kids were first little, I was shocked by the poetry they read in school because they read these, you know, it's raining, it's pouring, old man is storing. Well, that's a cute little song, but that's not poetry. You know, I mean, kids can absorb so much beautiful language and they don't need to understand it. But um, the early grade teachers mostly felt like, oh, that's too advanced for them. They're not going to get that. And I thought, well, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter. They don't need to understand it. They can just hear it, right? Mm -hmm. In the same way that kids can just hear a second language or a third language and pick it up. And in the States, we're awful with foreign language learning, right? We don't learn until, start to learn foreign languages usually until kids are 12 or 13. In which case, you know, they've already lost that innate capacity to take on the other language. So I really think, you know, learning, listening to beautiful language from a young age is really important. You don't need to understand it even. You can just hear the cadences. Mm -hmm. And so much of um, great American, English language poetry came from people who were brought up reading the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. which is just like beautiful, beautiful language. The mm -hmm. cadences and the music of it are beautiful. Mm -hmm. People got that into their bodies, into their ears, and that's what English poetry, the tradition of English poetry came out of. Mm -hmm. And as 
reading has changed, so has writing changed. Mm-hmm. So I think the way to become a good, you know, quote unquote good writer, but a, a writer who really attends to the words on the page and the beauty of the language is to cultivate that ear mm-hmm. for writing mm-hmm. that's, that's doing that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think evaluating, you know, do, what do you think about the difference between creative and non-creative writing? I ultimately think that there isn't any difference. <laughs> and, I mean, there, people make a difference, but I, I think there doesn't need to be. Uh, you know what I mean? And I was, but it doesn't matter what I mean right now because I'm more interested in what you think. Um, so what do you, how do you feel about the different types of writing? And do you think that different types of texts require a different creative process? Or do you think that ultimately it's the same? Well, I mean, I think it's a continuum. Um, I write poetry and prose. And I really like working in both mediums. And I, I just feel like I'm no ever fit in well into any one box. Mm-hmm. I think it's relatively rare in America. People are either poets or prose writers. And there mm-hmm. aren't that many people who cross over between the two. And I just feel like, well, sometimes what I want to say comes in poetry. And sometimes what I want to say comes in prose. They're both kind of creative writing. But then sometimes I'll write more expository writing mm-hmm. to kind of teach something and what's the difference Mm -hmm. they take different forms but the different forms i think are connected to what wants to be said Mm -hmm. so it's not the form that dictates what's written Mm -hmm. it's what needs to be said that decides the form ah interesting Mm -hmm. so in a poem there's a lot for me often in a poem there's a lot happening that I want the reader to attend to, that I want to attend to between the words. Mm -hmm. And so often a poem is the way to kind of open up those spaces. Mm -hmm. If I want to kind of go more directly at something that feels a little bit more like I want to make it denser in some way, often I'll go to prose. Mm -hmm. That's an oversimplification. Mm-hmm. But I think that the what I want to say chooses the form that I'm writing in. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I think of the distinction between creative writing and less creative writing is creative writing for me at least always is a process of discovery where I'm going to discover what I want to say in the process of writing it. Mm-hmm. The form itself is going to be part of what I want to say. Mm-hmm. And when I kind of know what I want to say and I just put it on paper, that feels a little bit less creative. But I find that often, even when we think we know what we want to say, in that process of writing, we learn something new. We realize, oh, wait, there's another level. Or when I'm having a problem or I'm working with a client or a student who's having a problem writing something, it's often not in the writing. It's often in the conceptualizing we can't quite say it because we don't quite know what it is that we want to say. Mm -hmm. And that helps us see our own self Mm -hmm. and our own mind better Mm -hmm. in that process. And so it can be this really, really beautiful process of discovery and of self-awareness, a kind of across creative, non-creative poetry, prose across all genres. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's really the same for all real writing. You know, for all writing that has a soul in it. And, and that, that's the only kind of writing that I like. You know, there's um, many years ago, I read a chemistry book that was written like that. It was beautiful language. And I felt that it was this act of recreating an experience. And it just happened to be a chemical experience. Mm-hmm. And, and then it was interesting to read. And it maybe made you more interested in chemistry because it brought some mystery, perhaps, and some discovery into yes. how interesting of really chemistry is about all about transformation. Yes. You know, going from one state to another state. Yes, exactly. And to some extent, that's what writing should be about. It should be about you start one place and you end up. You don't know where you're going to end up, but you're going to end up someplace a little bit different. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, it was, it was exactly like you say. I never thought I would ever be interested in chemistry. <laughs> and, and the writing made me interested. Right. Yeah, like a good teacher, right? This thing that can seem boring all of a sudden can come to life. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this interesting story, uh, and I'm so bad. My memory is so bad, especially with names. But there's this one poet, um, lady poet. What do you say? Do you say that? <laughs> no. Um, is there a, um, an, a female ending for poet? No, just a poet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and she, she talked about how sometimes she would be out on a walk and she felt this poem was rushing up and then she had to rush to her desk who was that and had to try to catch it and if she was yeah, yeah. pardon um, um also i know elizabeth gilbert talks about her in big magic mm -hmm. and i am also forgetting the name of the poet um and that's so interesting do you sometimes feel like that 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 something wants to be written and you can't quite get to it or you were too late Yeah, I, I, a few times I've maybe had that experience. I wouldn't say that's a super common experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe a few times. I do definitely remember that description of being very captivating. Mm -hmm. um, I find more often that it's not external to me. Mm -hmm. It's opening up a channel that's in me already, but that most of the time is blocked. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. And then if I can unblock it, it can kind of make its way out. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of flowing then. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the day, we kind of have to protect that space because we're going about doing other things and we don't just leave, leave it open. Mm -hmm. So when we can clear our space, when we can clear time, which is really important, and when we can be open to that voice and kind of know to look, oh, what's coming? And he's, oh, okay, now I'm going to just write it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. There was something else I wanted to ask, but I guess you get all, all um, <laughs> taken up by listening to this. Um, shoot. <laughs> it, was, it was really urgent too. Oh, yes, now I do. Um, you know, I feel that when... As a teacher, we're always supposed to judge what people are writing. And I find it in some ways impossible and in some ways not. Um, you know, as you know, I'm enthusiastic about grammar. It wasn't always the case, but I am now. <laughs> and I feel that it's like the matrix, the rhythmic matrix that enables words to enter into a relationship mm -hmm. with each other. You know, like words just have meaning potential, but then the then syntax somehow enables this encounter and and certain structures imposes also certain boundaries you know like i'm i mean it's the same for humans i mean if i choose a relationship with you at this moment then there's no space for another relationship right right at this moment or an, another encounter and um and so there are some things where i can f say well if you mean to express this then you can't choose that form right now because there's a certain kind of leeway, but then there's also a restriction. You know what I mean? So there are certain things where we can say, well, for what you want to say or for your purpose or for this situation, there is a jarring or this doesn't work. There is a hiccup here. But I can't say, well, I, I, I hate, I, I'm glad that I'm not a teacher in a school anymore where I have to say, good or bad, right or wrong, and give you a grade, you know? Yeah. Oh, I'm very yeah. glad not to have to give grades. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the things that really impedes a lot of people's writing is mm -hmm. that they vote in school for mm -hmm. a grade for so long. And so mm -hmm. immediately people sit down to write in that voice of judgment. Mm -hmm. You're going to be graded, compared. How good are you is going to come up. And then mm -hmm. that inhibits people. Mm -hmm. so I really believe that we can write better. Mm -hmm. We can be taught. We can work at it. We can get feedback that's helpful. Mm -hmm. That the form and the function go together again. So, um, and structure and rules all help. And just as in a yoga practice, um, there can be great free movement where we come in touch with our body. 
But yoga has certain forms and there are ancient forms and there's wisdom in the form. And when we bring our body into these forms and really learn how to use them, mm -hmm. then we get some really amazing results. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to writing. Like sometimes the form helps create the freedom of the meaning. Mm -hmm. So all of those things I think are true. And, but I love working in situations where I don't need to give a grade so people can go at their own pace. It's not, you don't need to say the first thing you write needs to be finished. We can go through drafts. We can make mistakes. We can write things that we don't ever want to publish. Mm -hmm. We can have a wide range. You know what? I wrote that. That really didn't connect with me. It didn't connect with the readers. It was just kind of messy. And then I wrote this and that really worked and that really connected with readers and it really said something really powerful and mm -hmm. it was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. We can, we don't all need to get a straight A on, you know, this uh, due date every time. Mm -hmm. We have the freedom to really explore and take our time and be in a process that mm -hmm. has its own kind of timetable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, I... I think I think it was Chris Carr who said, I always write books for myself that I need to read. And then if I'm lucky, other people write to read them, like to read them too. And I felt that, well, that really resonated with me. And in a way, I think that's true for almost all writing. Um, and yet it can be, somehow you can read it and you, you can feel there's a hiccup. You know, to me, it feels like a contradiction. Like somehow this person needed to write this and still... I come in and say, I think you can do better. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, yeah. and I feel that with my own writing. I mean, I, I, I know, you know, I just went through a German text with my my friend and she, you know, she found all the hiccups and, and somehow I, I had felt uncomfortable, but when she was saying it, I just thought, oh, duh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, you know, I think this is another misconception is that real professional writers know how to write it without the hiccups. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why they're editors. Mm -hmm. And that's why writers, almost all writers have a community of writers that they share their work with mm -hmm. and edit one another's work. Mm -hmm. So yes, we write for ourselves as a process of discovery to learn what we need to learn. Mm -hmm. But we also write to share with other people. Mm -hmm. And we want to connect with readers. So that's great. Chris Carr writes this material that she, she learns. But then she also has taught so many people. Yes, so many people have benefited. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard when you're so close to the material to get inside someone else's mind. Mm -hmm. So she works with editors. Mm -hmm. And we all work with editors and coaches and mm -hmm. friends and, you know, get that perspective where where is it hiccup okay let's edit this mm -hmm. maybe that's not so clear mm -hmm. and you know maybe you don't have so much experience translating from what you've learned to the page so then you work more closely with someone as a coach or in a class mm -hmm. um, that you know it's a process yes we're it's a process ourselves. and we're doing it to share with others and it makes sense then that we need certain tools to translate from what I understand into terms that you're going to understand it because mm -hmm. I want to reach as many people as I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a process. And, and I actually enjoy the, I, I enjoy working on drafts. I, the first step is always the hardest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. because then you can kind of play around. You don't need to start from scratch. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I actually think it's also fun to discuss it with other people. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think it's yeah. it's great fun, and and it's so sad that in schools, the joy is taken out of this part of um of the birthing process mm -hmm. because it, it, you can have such great communion with someone else over it. Yeah, and I think sometimes in schools, they're kind of starting to do this model where kids are reading and critiquing other kids' papers and really having interesting conversations back and forth. And mm -hmm. we learn so much about writing also from editing. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's hard to see in my own work what's happening, but I see it in someone else's and then, oh, right. Mm -hmm. I need to do that too. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, I always tell my clients, you know, I'm working with clients on their writing. Oh, my gosh, how can you do that? I'm never going to be able to learn how to do this by myself. I say, well, you don't need to learn how to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I'm here for. And I also work with an editor and I have a writing coach because, and and my coach has a coach. It's Mm -hmm. not a, it's a circle. Yeah. You know, it's not a hierarchy because we all need readers to read our work. Mm Mm-hmm. We all need that external feedback. I'm glad, I'm glad you're saying that. And I'm glad you're, you're, you're telling us that you also have a coach and that your coach has a coach. Now, I always feel I need, I need a coach as well. You know, we're in such giving, um, giving professions. Mm-hmm. And I, I always tell my students, well, you know, you can't take chocolates out of a box of chocolates if nobody ever put anything in there. And putting, putting the chocolates in is such a long process it takes so much longer than taking it out and eating it right yeah. throw the chocolate and then process it and and what have you and and it's the same for for us you know we when we give out we need to take in and uh, yeah and, yeah and to, to we imagine the structure so that it's not like a hierarchy going up to the top but instead a circle Mm-hmm. where we're supporting one another. Yes. You know, my area of expertise is here and your area of expertise is here. Mm-hmm. And, and then we can share areas of expertise because I can edit your work and you can edit my work in a different way from the way I can edit my own work. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And so we support one another. And that's how we're, we're, we have this funny idea. And, and writing really brings that up, that writing is this, you know, supposed to be this solitary act, but it's, it's not. Writers, again, going back to writers come from communities of readers. Mm -hmm. I didn't invent writing. No. We grow up reading. That's our community. We're learning from those readers. We're learning from our peers who are also writers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being part of a community of of writers and people Mm -hmm. who are engaged in this process and in this, you know, way of thinking and interacting with the world, which is also why I like to have classes so that we can have students who are interacting in community Mm -hmm. this endeavor together you're not just alone yeah right because it shouldn't be a solitary thing it's about communication and community yes and that's actually your facebook group is also really great you know i you know i i didn't like the idea of facebook but then i joined it because i wanted to be able to be part of such communities and that has been really great yeah it's it's like a safe but, you know, it is, I, I felt safe, you know, I don't care yeah. what people say that everything is stored. <laughs> it is, it is safe from trolls and it is, it is, uh, and you can get this, this community and sisterhood and this protection and, and the loving interaction. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's, it's, I feel so lucky to have that community as part of the course, because again, you know, it's setting up the boundaries, setting up a structure to have the freedom within it. Mm-hmm have these kinds of nice conversations and um, Mm -hmm. support for one another. Yeah. You're about to launch another round, aren't you? Yes, I'm going to be launching another round. Um, I think I'm going to, I push the start date back just a little bit because I think the mid winter that we're in now is a little bit, people are kind of in their groove. So we're going to start in early spring Mm -hmm. in March. Oh, in March. Um, mm-hmm. So when people sign up for the course, they can get immediate access to mm-hmm. all the online material if they want to start early, mm-hmm. they start by themselves, and then we'll start the conference calls again mm-hmm. in March mm-hmm. and have that, you know, early spring to go together with the new life is <laughs> coming in the earth and <laughs> we'll, mm-hmm. we'll have the conference calls to go in a more structured manner through the material in the course. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when people sign up, they have lifelong access so they can come back whenever they want and come on the conference calls the next time I offer the class again. Mm-hmm. So they could sign up right now. They could sign up right now. Exactly. And I will put, um, put your, um, your website address and everything in the description box below. That would be great. And um, I think all the information you need is there. But if anyone has questions, Mm -hmm. I am also very accessible. So you can just reach out to me through my website, NadiaColburn.com, through the contact Mm -hmm. form, and I will get back to you and answer any questions. Yes, cool. I'll do that. Is there anything else you would like to say now for um, 
so that we can wrap it up? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, really just to encourage people to give themselves the permission to listen mm -hmm. to their own voice, to listen mm -hmm. to their own body, and to bring that mind and body wisdom together mm -hmm. so that they can trust their creativity and their, that authority that you have as a creative person to listen yeah. to your story, to, to write what you want to write, and to get support mm -hmm. because you don't need to do it alone. That's lovely. Thank you very much for sharing Thank all of this. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here with you. I hope to continue the conversation at uh, some later point. I think I'm sure we will. Talk about. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Fried.